Good morning, welcome to George Washington University's Welcome Home to Washington, fostering higher education success for veterans and their families. My name is Brian Hawthorne. I'm a senior here at GW, and I'm the president and co-founder of the veterans group here at GW, GW Vets. I have a deep connection to the symposium topic that we're going to be discussing today, and I've lived through many of the issues that will be examined. The idea for this symposium came to, together as part of a team as we investigated the issues that are facing veterans in higher education here at GW. Secretary Shinseki of the VA told me that 80%, 80% of Vietnam veterans used some portion of their educational benefits, yet their graduation rate was less than 40%. Now why is that? There's a lot of things that contribute to that rather embarrassing statistic, but some of it comes from the community that was or was not created on the campuses that they returned to. Now this year, we have the magnification of these issues with a new influx of veterans returning to, this, to the campuses under the post-9-11 GI Bill, which was passed last June by the President. So as we began to investigate these issues, we decided that GW served as a perfect place to investigate and to publish some of the lessons that we've learned and to start discussing what you all already know, which is that this is a very unique constituency attending colleges all around the world. This has been a very historic year, as you all know. We're still struggling through the post-911 GI Bill, and we're all very pleased, those of us who are benefiting from it, of the benefits that are enabling us to be able to receive this education. GW, in 1944, had the first recipient of the, of the original GI, Bo or, excuse me, GI Bill, Mr. Don Balfour, who was the editor of our school newspaper and a Navy veteran. We were also named after the nation's most famous veteran, as you all know, and seated here in the heart of Washington, D.C., where many of these debates are going on right now down the road. So the intention of this symposium is to cover four major issues. Student veteran so support and transition, creative solutions and systems and institutional change, mental health and disability services, and educating the campus community to actively promote a culture of inclusion. We'd like to thank the array of scholars and practitioners gathered here today from throughout the country to explore these very important topics, and thank you for joining us to continue and hopefully foster some further discussion. Our first speaker this morning ties directly into the goals of this symposium, and I have the honor of introducing an individual who leads an institution who has done so much to raise awareness among higher education administrators of veterans issues. A leading spokesperson for the American Higher Education Program, Molly Corbett Broad became the 12th president of the American Council on Education May 1, 2008. And she's the first woman to lead this institution since its founding in 1918. Ms. Broad came to ACE from the University of North Carolina, where she served as president from 1997 to 2006. At the California State University System, she served as senior vice chancellor for administration and finance from 92 to 93, and executive vice chancellor and chief operating officer from 93 until her election as the UNC president. Since she has become president of ACE, Ms. Broad and ACE have become strong advocates in fostering veteran success in higher education. And just a recent sampling of their publications to help military education administrators include transfer guides, serving those who serve higher education and American veterans, and a guide from soldier to student easing the transition of service members on campus. And I personally have the privilege of working with some of her staff on some of these issues, and they're very, very helpful and supportive. In 2009, ACE took another step in supporting veteran, veteran success by co-sponsoring 20 $100,000 grants to higher education institutions to enhance veteran services. The ACE Walmart Grant Success Program um, was a multi-year effort designed to affect major change in how veterans learn about their education benefits and post-secondary education. In addition, ACE's Serving Those Who Serve initiative includes college planning website and an outreach campaign to inform veterans about accessing and utilizing their educational benefits and several research-based publications. ACE also hosted several regional meetings that allowed institutions to discuss concerns and pose questions about the implementation of the post-911 GI Bill. And without further ado, I'd like to call the stage Ms. Molly Corbett Broad. Please give her a warm round of applause.
Thanks, Brian, very much. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to join you this morning to offer a few remarks and to introduce uh, the keynote speaker. It seems so appropriate for GW to be the university that is hosting this uh, Welcome Home uh, initiative today. Um, it's an important symposium and working on um, a truly strategic strategy and initiative in American higher education. Uh, I'd like to begin by expressing thanks um, to Brian and all of the other veterans that are part of the audience today, to you and your uh, families. Um, it always impresses me whether it is at an athletic event during halftime and the crowd is introduced to servicemen. Uh, folks rise to their feet and applaud. I see it in air, airplanes when a service person um, enters the plane. Um, we have many ways of conveying by our body language and by our words the extent to which we understand the pain, the stress, that they have been undergoing and find these small but symbolically important ways to express our thanks. As Brian mentioned, the American Council on Education uh, became involved actually before the passage of the GI Bill. And in the very first week that I was president of ACE, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a symposium at Georgetown University on severely injured veterans. It was extraordinarily moving. And um, it was a part of a, a program that ACE had underway, working with severely injured veterans in various military hospitals. And the symposium brought together several hundred college and university leaders presidents and vice presidents and directors together with student veterans and some of our most distinguished members of Congress. Um, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, um, one of the great champions of our time, um, was a major keynote speaker and uh, he spoke very eloquently, making referral to Two-thirds of a million uh, Americans in uniform have been involved over the course of the past century, demonstrating their full measure of devotion. Um, he conveyed the extent to which we mourn for the dead. He conveyed our awareness that often haunted men and women who bear the scars of these wars. And he closed his comments by saying, and I quote, nothing we say or do will be sufficient to repay the patriots and heroes for their sacrifice. Well, Senator Inouye is right. Veterans deserve the best, and thankfully, our government agreed with that conclusion in the enactment of the 9-11 Veterans Education Assistance Act. Um, it follows on the most important original GI Bill, but extends the benefits, as everyone in this room is aware of, with now more than 2 million service personnel who, who have served since 9-11 and who will be eligible for this uh, incredibly important uh, legislative program. So that's our purpose today, and I'd like to... Um, place the significance of the GI Bill in a larger context of our country and our higher education system. Um, and let me begin by acknowledging what we're all aware of, and that is the financial crisis that is roiling in our country. Since the beginning of the recession in December 2007, the number of unemployed personnel has grown from 7.6 million to 15, more than 15 million today. 
with the employment rate having doubled in that short period of time, now standing at just under 10%. Um, one can imagine with all of the challenges of returning veterans to come back home to a jobless economy would only make the challenges they face greater. It just seems perfect that the GI Bill provides opportunities for a transition, a personal transition, as well as a job and education transition. And it is all the more important because of the economic challenges that we are facing as a nation. We've lost $12.6 trillion of wealth in the year 2008 alone. And we are looking at a very substantial mountain of debt. Beyond the federal debt, we have huge debt in individuals, in households, and in consumption debt. And even though the housing market is hopefully turning back up, we still have um, more than a trillion dollars of home mortgages that are in delinquency or in default. So these are sobering statistics, but they also outline the importance of raising the level of educational attainment for the future prosperity of this nation. When we look back on the GI Bill after World War II, and I know Milt is the expert on this, but when we think about what has happened since the end of World War II as a result of the GI Bill, the captains of industry that were developed, and it is what built the greatest economy the world has ever known. The scientists and engineers that were in our workforce thanks to the GI Bill. We see the potential in the 21st century for accomplishing the same important economic and strategic goals for our nation um, as we did after World War II. And now we face some very interesting contextual circumstances with the growing economic power of China and India, the two largest nations in the world. Um, you know, their population, Chindia, as I like to call them, eight times the population of the United States. And if you look just at the young population going through school and into higher education, they have 10 times the number of individuals in those younger um, age cohorts. They are investing huge amounts of money into the expansion and the creation of new colleges and universities. They are actively moving their college participation rates up ever higher. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the U.S. had the greatest number of individuals that held a college degree and the greatest number of individuals enrolled in higher education. That is no longer the case, and as far as the eye can see, will forever not be the case. Uh, tremendous growth in China and in India. In the meantime, not only have we lost positioning in the number of educated individuals, but we have fallen from first in the world to 10th in the world in the youngest cohort of adults, those 25 to 34. And for the first time in recorded history, that population of the youngest cohort of adults has a lower level of educational attainment than the next oldest adult cohort. This has not happened before. We are at a tipping point. The American dream has been one in which every generation was better off than the previous generation. And being better off was tightly connected to having gained a higher education. President Obama, the Lumina Foundation, the College Board, the Gates Foundation have all laid out 
audacious goals, incredibly bold ambitions for the U.S. to regain that international leadership by 2020. The only way that is possible is if programs like the GI Bill can be implemented in, in full measure. It also means that we're going to have to turn to young people of color and young people from low-income families. And we're going to have to also look at adults, not just veterans, but displaced workers, those who may have dropped out of high school, and older adults. Uh, fortunately, when it comes to veterans, the same Uncle Sam who wanted you in the service now wants you to earn a college degree and is willing to help veterans pay for that. The new GI Bill presents an extraordinary opportunity to address the challenge of college affordability, and we must do more to help make that happen. Uh, the American Council on Education, as Brian indicated, has identified our work to advance the impact of the GI Bill as uh, a very high priority for us. And we will continue to invest um, our efforts and our priorities on building and strengthening the implementation of the GI Bill. I mentioned I'm off again uh, in a couple of days to make more calls on foundations uh, to help make sure that those grants that Brian mentioned that went to 20 colleges and universities can be extended and to not, we had 20 great applications for every grant that we could give. We did a survey of all of American higher education and got tremendous results on identification of what are best practices in serving the veterans. GW is an exemplar of best practice and I'll refer to that in a um, in another minute or two. Uh, but one of the interesting findings, um, for those of you um, in the profession, um, I think this will make you chuckle, but uh, some of the survey responses that we received from a given college or university were multiple. They came from different parts of the institution from the Veterans Affairs Office or, or the Admissions Office or the Provost's Office. And some of them said very different things. Uh, what we heard from the Admissions Office didn't align very well from what we heard from the Veterans Office. And I know this will shock you. Um, but what it helped us identify is the importance of finding new ways to integrate all of those services and to try to compensate for the silos that sometimes exist on, on college and university offices. Uh, GW is an exemplar of best practices, and all you need to do is go to the home page of this university to find some of the examples of the best practices that we found in surveying um, a thousand colleges and universities. There is a one-stop shop tab right on the home page of GW. It contains a checklist for student veterans. It provides easy information for applying and for dealing with uh, acceptance and um, contacts in key offices, both on the campus and off the campus. Um, in, at the end of August, GW provided an orientation session just for veterans. This is one of the best practices that we identified, was to have a special orientation. This is a dramatic transformation from the life they may have lived in um, uh, Iraq um, or Afghanistan. So having special orientation sessions is one of the best practices, and, and GW followed it. Uh, tremendous support from um, university officials, from the financial aid offices, from student accounts. And I think all of you have read in the newspapers that the Office of Veterans Affairs has had um, some challenge in getting the money out 
to deserving and qualified veterans. Um, and most colleges and universities, uh, even though they are in the midst of the greatest financial crisis, certainly in my professional lifetime, have managed to find ways to let those veterans continue through their courses without yet having their tuition paid by the Office of Veterans Affairs, or even in the case of housing because they haven't received their uh, stipends. The Student Veterans Organization here at GW also collaborated with a fraternity to host uh, an extremely successful standing room only forum that was called Ask a Vet. A student Veterans Organization collaborated with College Democrats to hold a Q&A session with the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, Representative Bob Filner. Um, GW has made a very significant commitment to the Yellow Ribbon Program, that program for private colleges and universities, so that the, uh, the dollar cost of tuition above that highest public university threshold will be matched dollar for dollar from Veterans Affairs if the university will match it. And in the case of GW, uh, $18,000 was set aside in matching funds for each of the veterans that were admitted. Um, and all of the qualified veterans that sought to come to GW were admitted and provided this amount of financial aid. So my hat is off to President Knapp and to the entire uh, leadership of uh, GW. Now let me turn to um, introduce uh, Milt Goldberg. Um, uh, he has played a very important role in the life of American higher education uh, for quite a few decades. Uh, he is not only a remarkable cro chronicler of um, the original and the new GI Bill, but he is someone who has dedicated himself to raising the standards of professional development and the quality of academic instruction in order that students have the greatest possible learning opportunities. The GI Bill, Milt Greenberg, refers to as the gift that keeps on giving for all who have served and ultimately for the benefit of the nation. Well, in that same spirit, I say that he is also a gift that keeps on giving ultimately for the benefit of students. He's Professor Emeritus of Government at American University, uh, where he served as provost and as interim president. He earned a BA from Brooklyn College, an MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He's a veteran of World War II. And he served as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division and earned his degrees with the support of the GI Bill. In 1994, which was the 50th anniversary of that GI Bill, he served as the guest editor of the ACE magazine, then called the Education Record, and edited that, that issue of the magazine that was devoted to the celebration of the GI Bill. The GI Bill and its lasting legacy was the title. Um, it was this law, this bill, that joined the heroic image of G.I. Joe with the iconic Bill of Rights. And Milt spoke so eloquently and so passionately about the importance of that connection. And then at the 60th anniversary of the G.I. Bill in 2004, he published an op-ed in the Chronicle of Higher Education entitled How the G.I. Bill Changed Higher Education. And after the June 2008 passage of the post-9-11 um, GI Bill, he wrote another article for the Chronicle of Higher Education comparing the new and the older versions of this historic legislation. Um, he has written the book on the GI Bill, and it is my great honor and my great pleasure 
to introduce Dr. Milton Greenberg. Greetings. <clears throat> I'm uh, <clears throat> hoping to provide you with a <clears throat> sort of historical context for why we're here today with giving you some information about the original GI Bill and how it became a lasting legacy of enormous significance. I don't know how many of you ever were invited to unveil a postage stamp, but uh, probably none, so. But I was, so I'm bragging about it a little bit. But I was invited about 10 years ago to, um, along with uh, Vice President Gore, to unveil a postage stamp dedicated to the GI Bill of Rights. And then in that, unforgettable moment for me, I told the assembled guests this, I am a first generation American, the son of immigrants, parents who were uneducated and harsh victims of the Great Depression, living in rented flats. When I was drafted just a few weeks after reaching the age of 18, I could not even imagine or conceive that one day I would not only be a professor, but that I would hold high positions in universities. And that I, along with my family, my wife, my children, would own a home, a home of our own. There is nothing unusual about what I just said, about my story. It is the WW2 GI Bill American Dream story. While no one could or did forecast the positive and durable aspects and impact of the GI Bill of Rights of 1944, and know what impact it would have upon the social fabric of the nation, the law clearly ranks among the top 10 important laws ever passed in this country from the beginning to this very day. It is still looked upon with appreciation, with respect, with reverence almost. Our nation continues to pay tribute to the idea of the GI Bill of Rights by affording similar benefits to the men and women of our military forces ever since that time. Today, we are paying special tribute to a new version of the GI Bill in which we're trying to consider how to maximize the opportunities it affords even to those most damaged physically and emotionally by the post 9-11 wars. I am honored to be among you for that purpose. Though mythology might suggest that it was, that the 1944 law was the result of unbridled generosity on the part of a grateful Congress, the passage of the GI Bill was in large measure a justified concern and even fear about a radicalized post-World War II America. Prior to World War II, America had provided benefits and care only to those veterans who had physical disabilities, who were disabled by combat, and very little attention was paid to other veterans. In fact, after World War I, discharged veterans were given $60, a train ticket home, and a promise that in the future they'd get a bonus. 
And that led, that post-World War I led to terrible times, as you know, in Europe and in this country as well. The marches, riots among veterans seeking that bonus. Because for 12 years prior to the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, this nation was in a deep, deep depression that you've all known as the Great Depression. World War II found us as a nation unprepared and largely uneducated, faced with the need to build a fighting force of young people who had only known the Depression, and few of them had even had a job. Their parents, like mine, were victims of the 30s, and entire families faced a life of poverty and joblessness. It was the outbreak of the war in Europe in 1939 that lifted the cloud of the Depression from the United States. The military draft <clears throat> absorbed all the young men, and everybody else went to work producing wartime materials. When you then <clears throat> add that 12 years from the Depression of 1929 to about 1941, and then add four more years of war, I mean, this was four years of war worldwide, involving 15, 16 million members of the American military alone, we had 16 years of pent-up demand of just the strangest kind of life in this country. Fortunately, when the war ended suddenly, literally with the atomic bang, the GI Bill was in place, having been passed in 1944. As we faced in 1945, the return of almost 16 million veterans who were dispersed all over the world, and a huge proportion of them were abroad. And we began discharging them at the rate of a million a month. Critically important was one thing no one quite realized about the genius of the GI Bill, because the truth is, not everybody knew what was going on, and even in Congress, it, they, they would, did not realize what they were doing particularly, as is often the case. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits were available to everybody who was a veteran upon their release with honorable discharge from active service. The rules were the same for everybody. The only requirement was that you have military service for at least 90 days and honorable discharge. There were no provisions in the bill to recognize the nature of your service, your rank, whether you were an officer, an enlisted man, whether you were married or single. The length of service counted only towards how much education you could get, that is, by, by the month. There were no complex tax credits, no minimal, I mean, no red tape particularly, no financial tests were applied, didn't matter whether you were rich or poor, black or white, whether you had an education or didn't have an education. They were, all these things were irrelevant. It was open to everybody, so it created an enormous good mood, good feeling. You have to pause here because of our, my at least, adulation of the GI Bill. And recall that the post-war GI Bill, 1944, was carried out under policies of racial segregation and discrimination and enormous religious discrimination in this country. The military was segregated until 1948. That was well after the war ended. The school segregation case, which we all know, Brown versus Board of Education, that was 1954. So all this was going on under a segregated society. 
Jewish war veterans began to gain entry into schools where they had been quoted out for many, many years. And eventually, especially in the northern cities, Catholics, Jews, and blacks began creating a middle class. And in a sense, that began the end of religious bigotry in American higher education. And slowly, it began to establish a black middle class in the North. Women were practically invisible during this time. Available information indicates that there were about 350,000 women who served in the military at that time, and, and about 64,000 of them were known to have gone to college under the GI Bill. So while it is true that women made great progress during World War II in, in jobs, and you remember, you've heard about Rosie the Riveter, the day we dedicated the GI Bill stamp, they also dedicated the Rosie the Riveter stamp. The high, the, the post-war experience of enormous uh, growth in the marriage rate and the birth rate, in home ownership, in, in a whole new style of life in this country, led to a return, this is surprising, of women to more traditional roles for about 20 more years. So it was not really that generation of women that became the leaders of the women's liberation movement. It really was their own, their daughters, their daughters of the 60s and all. And um, they became the, that, wild generation of the 60s and 70s who gave us all so much trouble. <laughs> Some other interesting things. No one forecast the amazing success of the GI Bill. And for good reason. High school graduation was a rare thing then. In fact, we have reason to be ashamed of how badly we do right now. But then, millions of members of the armed forces <clears throat> had not even graduated from grammar school. And many young Americans did not go beyond the 10th grade. Listen to this. Only 23% of the military of World War II had a high school diploma. And 3% at college degrees. Think about that for a moment. It's amazing. Whenever I talk on this subject, this is what people remember. I don't know why, but they do. So if you've ever thought of our country as one that was always highly educated, it's not true. The GI Bill began that. The educational benefits were extraordinarily generous. And about half the veterans took advantage of the opportunity. So there were still half who never did take any advantage of it. There were about 2.2 million who eventually went to college, but close to 6 million who took advantage of other educational programs in vocational training and farm training and in other things other than regular college. Prior to World War II, Higher education in this country was mostly private, liberal arts, small college, residential, elitist, discriminatory. And it didn't take but a couple of years before that began to turn dramatically. So antonyms of those words come into play. It went from private to public, occupational and technical in place of just liberal arts, huge schools, urban schools, commuter schools, less elitist somewhat, elitism never leaves higher education, but there was always a place somebody could go, which was not true before. You can always find a place for higher education in this country now. 
so that we changed from the kind of certification of the already elite through colleges to a system of upward mobility for heterogeneous populations. And it marked American higher education thereafter. And, and through that, the mission of higher education has changed to include an incredible array of options. For those of us in higher education, the legacy of the GI Bill is everywhere in our professional lives. The new clientele who filled the colleges and universities gave new meaning to the word student. Many had spent up to four years in the military. Most were already in their mid to late 20s. About half were married when they came to school. And half of those who were married had children. Excuse me. I should have memorized this. It is hard now to believe that many colleges prior to World War II prohibited the enrollment of married students. And the very thought of having older veterans living in residence halls or fraternity houses raised fears too impure for me to discuss with you. <laughs> but I will let you contemplate one kind of sexy idea. In 1946, there were 600,000 more babies born than in 1945, and you know how that happens. <laughs> that was the baby boomer generation that, I repeat, gave us all that trouble. <laughs> Few colleges were prepared for the numbers of veterans who appeared to register. None were prepared for the wives and children of students. Memories of those times, like for me and my wife, unfailingly brings smiles to the faces of those who were not particularly smiling then. The numbers of students on some campuses was impressive and troublesome. Many state universities doubled or tripled in size within a year or two. Sheer necessity to make higher education responsive to unprecedented demand led to the performance of miracles by many of the major colleges in this country. Huge lines of students, overflown, overflow classrooms, harried faculty and staff. Faculty and staff think they're harried now. They should have been around then. And everywhere there were Quonset huts, trailer camps, tents, people living in rented rooms. It was a fabulous time. <laughs> and everywhere you went, there were buildings going up. It was like a movie, you know. I always think of movies where they show you buildings going up real fast. To say that the J.I. Bill of 1944 was transformative is an understatement. It was revolutionary. Colleges and universities multiplied. The major shortage of a skilled workforce was met with the education of tens and thousands of engineers and accountants, teachers, doctors, dentists, lawyers, and research scientists, who then began to be followed into higher education by their children and their grandchildren. And that's where we are now. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It wasn't that many years ago. I mean, after all, I was alive. And I was in my 20s. I mean, so it's, it's, we're not talking about something that happened in the olden days. Higher education was turned from a hope to an expectation, a very important change of the mental set. Upward mobility became the hallmark of the higher education enterprise. The idea was born that lives on so strongly today that education is a pathway to a better job, that anyone can go to college, not just the children of the rich and not just the single, and that higher education can be viewed as an entitlement 
for anyone willing to use it. Now, more than 16 million people are enrolled in higher education in the United States. The GI Bill nourished three durable legacies. First among its lasting legacies is that education can and should be made available to everyone, regardless of age, of sex, religion, family status. Second legacy of the GI Bill is one that is often not quite clearly seen. But it turned our nation into what Thomas Jefferson called independent yeoman. You've heard that phrase. By which he meant self-sufficient people, owners of property through the uh, loans for homes and businesses, and also owners of credentials. I mean, when you have a lawyer's certificate, a medical degree, a PhD, that's, that's property. And that became the, the yeomanship of each of us having a stake in our society and, and eager to take care of it and defend it. The third extraordinary legacy, also not fully appreciated, is the unique tie between a military and educational opportunity that is now so well established and which we're celebrating here today in a rather extended form. Benefits of World War II were diminished somewhat in future conflicts like Korea and Vietnam, but the rights continued of some form of the GI Bill for veterans. And then in 1973, when we moved to a volunteer army, which is a big difference, you know, between everyone being drafted and then you have volunteers, we still continue to provide these opportunities. What led to the post-11 GI Bill was that the cost of universities and colleges was running far ahead of the amount of money that was being appropriated under the Montgomery GI Bill, as it was called. And the, the, um, there was a smaller number of, of uh, military involved, and so the social pressures were somewhat less. But the surprising engagement of, in a long time and brutal and vicious Iraq and Afghanistan situation uh, made people realize we have got to do something more than we have been doing. And in order to maintain a volunteer army, you've got to give them incentives to join. So the GI Bill educational provision not only became a reward, it became an incentive for why you want to go. And um, this, uh, excuse me, and this is necessary for continuing adequate recruitment of volunteers. And notably, this law also provides a very special thing. If you're in the military for a career, your children and your wife can take advantage of the GI Bill. The characteristics of today's military force barely resemble those of the generation of World War II. The military now numbers actively about a million and a half, plus another million and a half in various uh, reserve services. So that's a far cry from the total mobilization of World War II. Most enlisted members of the armed forces also differ, again referring back to my 23% figure, where now almost all GIs have high school diplomas. And in order to be an officer, you have to have a college degree. Again, there are exceptions, but that's the general rule. And you have to have a lot of technical knowledge to be in the military, so it's a whole different brand of people. Moreover, our military provides enormous educational opportunities uh, continuously through voluntary education programs of the Department of Defense and the Service Members Opportunity Colleges 
a coalition of 1,800 colleges and universities that allow military personnel and their families to take courses wherever they are, including on ships. There is another interesting key difference between World War II and this volunteer army and this war. World War II, to most Americans, is an iconic event. It's thought of as a good war, a just war, with clear enemies and allies. It is as though literally, literally millions and millions of people who were killed during World War II, I mean, it was enormous, hundreds of millions everywhere, sort of like collateral damage. The surviving generation has been labeled the greatest generation, marked by their modesty <clears throat> about their accomplishments and famous for their silence about what happened to them. The clearly physically disabled were, were treated, but many suffered pains that were undetected. In those days, many soldiers were quoted as saying in interviews, he says, we didn't know what was wrong with us. Today you call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. It was often said by uh, in, uh, veterans, I felt that I, if I said anything, I would be weak. I never associated my problems with the war, which is an extremely interesting thing. It will take several years to measure the new law's influence on colleges and universities. But we need not hold the new law alongside the old law to measure them. The important thing is there is a legacy of continuing affiliation and commitment that the military is not just military, it is a pathway and part of the cycle of education in our country. And now, as Molly Broad pointed out, we need even more because of the commitments we need to make to sustain ourselves in worldwide competition. The GI Bill of Rights, what a combination of GI, you know, Bill of Rights, and this feeling that it's like one of the greatest slogans of all time. How can you be against anything like that? And it provides another great iconic image for us that you not only can serve your country, but that gives you a right to an education that surely is one of the great concepts of all time. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to call to the stage the veterans panel. And while we're uh, transitioning from the keynote, uh, I'd like to also welcome folks uh, to sit down. We have, a lot, we have some open seats at the reserve table as well as, I guess, throughout the room. So please, uh, please take your seats. This next panel is uh, a continuation. We're going to take the discussion from the greatest generation to the uh, newer generations when it comes to uh, veterans. And uh, the panel is going to be facilitated by my colleague, Dick Golden. So I'll let, let you all get settled, and we'll start in just a minute. And I would like to reiterate my uh, thanks to our incredible speakers this morning and I was uh, pleased with the juxtaposition of them when Molly presented such an incredible and incisive look at where we stand as a society here as we approach the end of the first decade of the 21st century, the daunting challenges in education, uh, having 12, million, 12 trillion dollars uh, in resources evaporate uh, in one year and then to have Milton come forward and remind us we've been there before and uh, his generation, I'm part of the generation that gave his generation so much trouble that he was referring to, but how his generation that some call the, uh, the best generation, the greatest generation, uh, 
through education and through service uh, help bring us a, a miraculous and incredible uh, life here in the United States. Early, too, we mentioned that uh, it's a very appropriate that we should be having this uh, day-long series of events that actually began last evening here at the George Washington University. Uh, as you've read in your literature, uh, this university, of course, was named after the first uh, leader of the Continental Army and the first commander-in-chief, George Washington, who, when he was eulogized by uh, Henry Lee in uh, 1799, Henry Lee said he was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. This is the university that 65 years ago welcomed the first recipient of that GI uh, Bill of Rights that, Don, uh, that uh, Milton talked about, Don Balfour. And to have this event occur in the same month that GW presented the inaugural Colin Powell Award to the Assistant Secretary for Veterans Affairs, Tammy Duckworth, who will be in this room at 1 o'clock to speak during the luncheon, also is quite appropriate. Uh, Colin Powell received his master's from GW in 1971. Secretary Duckworth received her master's from GW in 1992, then went on to serve with such distinction and valor as a major in the Illinois Army National Guard and as a Black Hawk uh, helicopter pilot in Iraq, serving uh, service that earned her, among other honors, the Purple Heart, the Air Medal, and the Combat Action Badge. I didn't attend the other evening, but I read a transcript of the comments Tammy made after she was uh, presented the Cole and Paul Award, the inaugural presentation. And Tammy said, the greatest honor in my life has and always will be the privilege of serving in uniform next to the finest people I have ever known. They are why I wake up every day with a sense of purpose and a renewed vow to live my life to the fullest. I refuse to dishonor those who do not make it home by wasting my second chance in life. We have a very distinguished uh, panel. I want to thank them first for joining us on stage and thank them too for their service of their country. And We earlier on met uh, Brian Hawthorne. He's a senior here at GW. He's studying geography and international affairs. A paratroop in the US Army Reserves, he has served two tours of duty in Iraq as a medic. And he re he's the recipient of the Bronze Star. Brian, you're also founder and current president of the GW Veterans Organization. Can you tell us just a little bit about that organization? Sure. Uh, coming here last year, we uh, actually sat on the first floor of this building and started out picking out people with short haircuts and military backpacks and thousand-yard stairs. And we suddenly had about a dozen of us, and we realized that everyone else knew another one or two veterans at GW, and we're it's astonished that we even had that many. It turns out we have about 400, and uh, so we're kind of elusive here. And so from that point, we formed this organization with a lot of support from the university um, and are now obviously critical in trying to help the future generations of student veterans here. Very good. Thank you very much, Brian. Paul Schutte is a, a veteran of the uh, Vietnam War and has distinguished himself here at G, uh, GW, currently as an adjunct lecturer in the GW School of Education and Human Development, where he developed a graduate course titled Living and Dying, a Counseling Perspective. Until 2002, he was director of health sciences programs at GW, and he oversaw 11 graduate and undergraduate health service programs. And Paul, you've had a, a, at least 25 years of uh, experience working with people living with life-challenging illness, grief, and the loss and life transition also. And you're also involved in the Student Veterans Association? Yes. Um, I just wanted to clarify. I. I'm also the director of a new program here at GW. Um, it's a graduate certificate in grief, loss, and life transition through the counseling department. Um, I have to say that the fact that I'm sitting up here surprises me more than you'll know. Um, I, too, am part of the generation that caused so much trouble during the 60s and 70s, and damn it, I hope I continue to. <laughs> um, I noticed, and this is no d disrespect meaning this, um, meaning in this, um, Vietnam was mentioned once um, in the previous speeches, which gives you an indication of what veterans of the GI generation went through. I am not here to whine and complain. Believe me. 
I am grateful to be an American, I am grateful to be here, and I am grateful for having served my country. But what I want to say is what happened to us is certainly different than what happened to the World War II veterans and what thankfully is hoping, happening with the current Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, and that's why I'm here. My experience was I was drafted. I went to Vietnam as a single person. I did not go as a unit. We get there, we had to fit ourselves into an existing unit. This is everybody. You spent your time, found yourself on a plane by yourself, coming back to this country, getting off the plane in your hometown, and expecting to just leave everything behind you. Impossible. And everybody up here will agree with me. The GI Bill I am so grateful for, not because I used it completely, but because it got me started. One of the things that we have to keep in mind is the GI Bill is a wonderful thing, but the atmosphere on the campus is what really holds the veterans here. You can use your GI Bill, but if you're not feeling welcomed on the campus that you're going to, you're not going to finish using your GI Bill. For my generation, we were afraid to set foot on a college campus. We hid ourselves. That aside, it takes all of us who have served in a combat situation, and I, like Brian, was a medic for 15 months. Um, it takes a long time to adjust yourself back to a civilian world. And it's not like I get off the plane and, oh good, now I can go back to school. It takes a while to get to the point where that's even a consideration. So my own fault, I had um, waited to go back to school, A, until the campuses settled down a little bit about how welcomed I was going to be or not be, but also I just needed to get my act together enough to feel like I could really focus on doing what I needed to do in college. I waited seven and a half years. We had ten years to take advantage of our benefits, and I think that speaks to the statistic Brian was saying about only 40% of Vietnam veterans use their GI Bill. I think it's not because we didn't start, it's that we had to wait so long to start to get our acts together that by the time we did, it was, the benefit was done. But I will say, had it not been for that year and a half I had left of my benefits, which was my own fault, um, I wouldn't have started school. I did, and I found that that was what I really needed and I had reached a point in my life where I really wanted to give back. So I'm grateful to be sitting here. I'm grateful to be in the company of other veterans. But I want to just say that the thing I'm most grateful for is that this campus is welcoming our veterans home and trying its best to allow us to become a part of this community in a way that, at that time, I was not. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'd like to get back to Brian in, in just a few moments and, and hear his narrative of his uh, two tours of duty in Iraq and his service uh, experience. But Michelle Miller is the only panelist who hasn't seen uh, combat, but she represents uh, something that service offers America beyond combat. We usually think of them, we think of the GI Bill of Rights as people who have seen combat. But Michelle is a 2004 graduate of the Coast Guard Academy and uh, she has been involved in some harrowing uh, work in her time uh, in, the, in the service. Uh, she's a, a post 9-11 GI Bill recipient. And Michelle Miller, I'm wondering if you perhaps can tell us about your background and your narrative. I graduated from the Coast Guard in um, May of 2004, and I'm probably one of the few people in the GW Vets group that actually was in before 9-11. So it's kind of a unique situation to look around and not know that many people that came in before we knew this was the world we were going to serve in. 
Um, but for me, I did counter narcotics for about a year um, off of South America and the Caribbean and then switched to port state control um, and vessel inspections in the maritime sector in Charleston. And then uh, post or Katrina happened and being in the Coast Guard, that was a huge event for us. So after that, I volunteered to take a critical fill billet down in New Orleans where I did intelligence and gain some expertise in um, responding to disasters because the area I was in, we did all of the border from Texas and Mexico all the way across the Gulf Coast to the Panhandle of Florida. And then we did all the way north um, up the Mississippi River. So we covered parts of 26 different states. So the Mississippi floods we were responsible for, um, all the hurricanes down on the Gulf Coast, and we responded to all of those. Um, and I got to a point where I didn't feel like I was doing what I joined the military to do. I didn't feel like I was helping people on a daily basis, and I decided to pursue my medical desires um, and made the decision that I was gonna leave the military. But, so I started applying, came to GW, and the big thing here for me, didn't realize I was choked up about this. Um, the big thing for me was that they valued my leadership experience, and that was probably the thing that set me apart in my class that got me in here into the physician assistant program. Mm -hmm. um, and recently, actually, I am gonna go back in, and January I'll be commissioned in the Navy where I'll be serving as a physician assistant afterwards. Now, I've read something about you, Michelle, that I find hard to believe as someone who has run a, uh, I've run a couple of marathons in my life, but you took part in something a few years ago at, in, for Walt Disney World. Uh, they call it a race and a half. You run a 13-mile race on Saturday and you wake up and run a marathon. Is, did you do that? I did that um, actually this past January. Just this, oh. I like to do unique things that everybody else can't claim that they've done. So that was <laughs> a thing of 5,000 people had done it and it was only the fourth year they've had it. So. That's phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you very much. Um, right to uh, Michelle's left is another one of our outstanding uh, panelists, uh, Daniel Schweitzer. And while attending the University of Guam, Dan was enrolled in the ROTC program and entered the service as an armor officer in the spring of 1999. Uh, I'd like to, if you would, Dan, tell us about your narrative and how you got to uh, GW and actually what you're studying here at GW. Maybe we could begin there. Sure. Um, I'm currently a second year student in the Masters of Forensic Science program here at GW. Um, I'm in my last semester. I'll be graduating or finishing this December. Um, as you mentioned, I uh, was graduated from the University of Guam and simultaneously commissioned uh, as an armor officer in the Army. Uh, my first duty station was in Korea. And as Michelle mentioned, this was pre-9-11, and Korea was the tip of the spear for the military, or at least the Army. That was, you know, that was where we expected, if anything were to happen, it would be there. Um, from there, I went to Fort Stewart um, and immediately deployed to Bosnia. Um, and again, like Michelle, I've had experiences not only in combat, but not in support operations and working in other countries where we're not trying to kill the enemy. And that's not what the military is all about. Um, we're very good at that if we have to do it. We do other things as well, and I'd like to make that point. Um, after Bosnia, I went back to Fort Stewart and trained in garrison as a scout platoon leader for about a year, um, and then moved into a staff job right before 3rd Infantry Division deployed uh, to Kuwait in support of what was then Operation Enduring Freedom and later became Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, I was with the 7th Cavalry as the division lead uh, for the invasion uh, of Iraq during OIF-1, as it's now called. Um, served about six months total there as a staff officer. Um, switched over to intelligence. I went back to Korea for another two years. Um, and again, something that your veterans on your campuses bring is I lived on the economy in Korea for two years in a Korean apartment, shopped at Korean grocery stores. So I had that exposure in non-combat environment to another culture, another environment, um, working with host nation security forces and host nation police on various projects. Um, after that, I went to Fort Meade and was a staff officer there for a while. And I had decided to get out of the military uh, on active duty and to pursue my master's degree because that's something I'd wanted to do and to move into law enforcement, which has always been uh, a goal of mine. Um, at that point, I had been accepted to GW to start in the spring of 2008, uh, received deployment orders to Iraq uh, that would take me out in January. So I deployed again to Iraq in January to August. I had to reapply for admission with GW, um, and it was while I was in Iraq for my second tour that I received an email from GW saying that I had uh, been accepted for the uh, fall 08 uh, semester. At the same time, I also got an had an application with a federal agency uh, for a law enforcement job I'd been pursuing, 
and had to make a very quick decision while I was deployed which avenue I wanted to pursue. Um, I eventually obviously decided to go with GW. I don't regret it. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I left Iraq in August of 08 and was starting uh, orientation in the 1st of September of 08 here at GW. Um, I've been here for about be close to a year and a half. Um, I'm, like Brian, still in the reserves, and I will be going back to Afghanistan in January. Uh, actually, my first tour to Afghanistan, but back on active duty for a period in January, which I think compared to maybe people of Paul's generation, um, and certainly Mr. Greenberg's generation, is a different experience too, where I have come on, off of active duty um, to a college campus setting, um, but uh, you know, Brian is still in the reserves, Michelle is going back to the Navy. A lot of us come back to college for a bit, and then may deploy again or may serve again with the military, whereas I think other generations it was usually a complete break from the military service when you were using your GI Bill benefits. Um, something I've been fortunate with is because I had a deployment right before I started, I've been able to use the money I saved during that um, to live off of and to go to school here where I know a lot of my colleagues um, have not been as fortunate. Um, and the first time somebody told me about the Yellow Ribbon Program or the, the post 9-11 GI Bill, I was deployed in Iraq when that came out, and the first person that told me about it, I called him a liar because I didn't believe that the federal government would actually be that generous compared to what had what had been the previous GI Bill. It was it was so paltry; it was it was almost an insult. Um, and so I'm really thankful for the new GI Bill. Uh, I'll be even more thankful once I get the first check. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan and Brian. I'd like to get back to you, and and if you would just elaborate a little bit, I just gave a cursory plans into your life and what you've accomplished so far, but what uh, motivated you to get into the service, and then if you could uh, recount your odyssey from there, please. Sure, um, and I think we're more interested in what you all want to ask us, so I'll try and keep this short. Um, I enlisted in 2003 right out of high school in New York, and um, I came from Westchester County. If anybody knows anything about Westchester County, it um, has the, one of the lowest military entry rates in the country. Uh, it's where the Clintons live, and anyway. Uh, so I, uh, I attended one of the best public high schools in the country, Pleasant Hill High School, where uh, we had a record of 100% college entry rate for about 15 years until me. Um, and that was a uh, rather controversial topic. And um, I actually was not at graduation. I was at basic training when I went, and people came up to my parents and said, I am so sorry. And that was the reception that I left when I left this, that community. And as if I was already dead. I mean, that was where I was. And, and they said, what a waste. And that was the impression that military service had in where I grew up. And this is not uncommon, especially not at a place like GW. Um, and so I enlisted, and I, I did a little bit of college in Rochester and decided I really didn't like the cold. And so I volunteered for my first deployment in Iraq and was there in Mosul 506, and then came home, moved down here, started applying to school, and... I was actually mobilized, short mobilized, uh, to go back as part of the surge in 2007. And I had already applied to GW, and I actually received my acceptance packet two weeks before I left for Baghdad. And so I called the little number down there, and they said, I said, well, I, I can't come. <laughs> I have this other thing I have to come do. And they said, oh, so you don't want to come. I said, no, I do want to come, but I want to come next year. And they said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well... We, we have all these deferments. You can get sick. You can, have, you can take a job overseas. I said, well, kind of. Um, but <laughs> there was no military deferment. And so I said, okay, well, that's odd. Um, and then I actually had a very um, on-the-ball academic advisor who took care of my packet. And so while I was in Iraq, I was enrolled in classes and paying bills, which was odd, and then disenrolled completely from the university all within about a month. Um, I got a very large bill, which made me kind of nervous for classes I wasn't attending. And then I came home, or I started to come home and started to apply to classes, and I was disenrolled and had no ability to apply to classes. So in nine months, I went from being a fully enrolled and attending classes, student paying bills, to being completely disenrolled from the university. And I wasn't even here. And so when, we got, when I came home and I met a few other veterans here at GW, I said, there's something wrong here because I shouldn't be on a satellite phone in a parking lot in Iraq trying to figure this out. There should be someone here to do that. And so we tried to bring attention to this to the university, and that's how we started this organization. And ultimately, um, GW did what many universities have not done, which is invited the students to the table. And what I think you're going to find about the veteran community, which is unique to, to almost any other constituency on a college campus, 
is that we will advocate for ourselves. We're not going to go to the student government, maybe a little, but <laughs> we're not going to go to the student government. We're not going to have rallies. We want a seat at the table because we want to be treated like adults. And so many times, and it happens, it still happens, that administrators refer to us as kids. Okay, I, I understand that. But we're not kids anymore. I'm not 19. And we had a little bit of life, and now we want a seat at the table to represent ourselves. And that unlike most constituencies in the university community, we don't want a staffer assigned to us to represent us. We want that representation ourselves. And that is where I think GW has really led the way in giving us not only that seat, but occasionally a podium uh, to talk <laughs> about it and, and to make a real difference. And I, I think that's where the success of this organization has come from, is being listened to. Hmm. So Thank you, Brian. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dan and follow up on what you've just mentioned um, a little bit about transitioning. I think it was Darwin who observed that uh, the strongest or the smartest are not the ones who survive, but those who have the ability to adapt are the ones to uh, survive. And Dan, beginning with you, what are some of the obstacles uh, that you found in trying to uh, transition from that? Uh, military experience to an educational experience? Uh, with my particular program being a graduate program, I think there's been pros and cons. Um, one of the more difficult things is um, coming back from a deployment. Um, I always happened to, happened to be living in Maryland before my deployment, so it wasn't quite as big a transition. Um, but if you enter the undergrad, there's a whole support network. I mean, people complain about the G World card and having to put all that money on their card to eat here at the university, but they have meal plans, they provide housing. As a graduate student, coming to a university trying to figure all this out from Iraq, that network is not quite as robust for a graduate student as an undergraduate student. So that was one of my more significant challenges was I was commuting um, two hours or more each day from Maryland for the first half of the semester um, for my classes. Uh, one day I had two classes and I commuted five hours for four hours of classes. Um, so that was my most significant challenge. Um, where I didn't have a challenge that some of the other people I've spoken to in our group that are not on this panel, so I'll speak a little bit from what I've heard of from them, is uh, adjusting to that civilian mentality and some of the more uh, inexperienced or um, less worldly points of view that you find on a college campus. Um, and I'm not going to debate right or wrong, but the acceptance that Paul talked about. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm in a program that is law enforcement centric. Many of my professors are former or current military members. And so there was a support network on, from the faculty side um, that may be not as uh, present in other programs that are not populated by folks who have that experience. And as we've talked about privately, you know, the hope is that in 10 or 15 years, people like us will become um, you know, the, the world experts and will be in those uh, policy arenas. Um, and so maybe future veterans won't find that challenge. Mm. That Thank you, Dan. You? Michelle, I heard you earlier today when we were talking, you mentioned uh, a moment in your life when you were talking with uh, a student here at GW and just comparing biographical notes and you m mentioned that the, the student had lamented the fact that her grandfather had died and, and you pointed out that you had the same situation in your life but that uh, you weren't able to come home for the uh, funeral and how service and sacrifice is sort of interchangeable. How is it, what was it like for you adapting into the educational culture? I think for me it was a unique situation because I also came into grad school um, and I got off active duty July 1st and started grad school August 3rd. So there was the whole moving process of getting here, finding people to live with because it was more expensive than New Orleans. But there's a lot of things I feel like we thought, or I had the misconception that physician assistant program was going to be older. So I thought the majority of the people in my program would be like 25-ish. And coming in at 27 and choosing to be a roommate with a 22-year-old was a big difference. Um, that I've learned now. But I think people didn't understand like my point of view of, I understand that things go on for you, but sometimes it's hard for me to convey to them. I wish they could see the bigger picture. And um, as I went to the video last night and saw that, I told Brian, I was like, you know, I look at what I've done. And I said, I haven't done anything. You know, I look at John, who's lost two of his legs, and yet here he is saying, well, I haven't done anything either. I just lost my legs. So it's one of those things of it's not necessarily about us, and that's why I wanted to be a part of this profession. And sometimes it's hard to see with people that may have been more fortunate, um, as I was going in, coming out of high school, that they don't realize how fortunate they really are and how much 
some other people have given up, so they have these freedoms and liberties to be here, um, to have an understanding program that lets you go home when you have a family member pass away versus being in a pre-deployment mode of t being told, well, we don't know when we're going to get you back, so you can't go. So it's been a big adjustment just to have people that are that much younger that are that self-centered, in my opinion. Um, and seeing that as a generation as a whole, and I saw it with people I was in the academy with by the time I was a senior and they were freshmen, it was just very self-centered on their own selves and not about giving back to others. Hmm. Paul, you've already touched on some of the uniqueness of your personal experience. I think for any of us who go to the National Mall, to take us 10 or 15 minutes to walk down and to see that uh, incredible memorial to Vietnam, 55,000 names or so on that wall, uh, you can't help but be emotionally uh, touched whenever you, you walk through there and see uh, now probably great-grandchildren, see an eight- or nine-year-old boy putting his hand up and feeling these letters on the wall. Uh, you, but you have uh, an incredible advantage in this issue because you see it, you're a clinician and you're actively involved in uh, the world of today, the early part of the 21st century. What are some of the... Uh, advantages you see uh, today that weren't there when, when you came on campus? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, talking about the wall, um, it took 20 years for us to be welcomed home. It's just one of the realities. One of the disturbing things for me and which sort of propelled me to go into the profession that I'm in, which is a psychotherapist and I specialize in grief and loss issues, um, was that every time I went down to the wall once it was built, um, there were men and women just like me weeping 20 years later. I also noticed when you watch TV and you see interviews with World War II veterans and they begin talking about their experience, the tears still come. Not to pick on you. <laughs> but Michelle, as she's talking about her experience, the tears still come. Um, there's a lot that we carry around. Um, one of the most horrifying statistics I have ever heard was that in the early 80s, the number of Vietnam veterans who had committed suicide grew higher than the number of veterans whose names appear on the wall. Hmm. Early 1980. I have no idea now what that number is like. But again, I just want to say that I am so grateful that this campus that I have been a part of for 2,000 years, um, <laughs> feels like, um, <clears throat> has decided, has made a decision that they are going to be a campus that welcomes veterans and provides services for the transitions that they and we are going through um, to help us integrate ourselves into a college community as frustrating as that might be sometimes. Um, because you have to really appreciate the fact that I was 19 when I went into the service and when I came out of the service I was 50. And that was only over 15 months. But honestly, um, the amount of maturation that goes on because of what you're doing, what you're seeing, the responsibility that you're giving, is so unbelievable compared to who you were before you had that experience. And so you come back to a community of people who haven't had that experience. Now, we were talking last night and I was saying, <clears throat> I finally learned not to be mad at everybody <laughs> because they didn't have the same experience that I did. But that took a while to get there. Um, I can't be angry with people because their life wasn't like mine. But I also want to say that there is a duty for all of us to try to put ourselves as much as we possibly can into some level of understanding of what we are presenting with when we try to fit into this community. And a lot of it is leadership skills that perhaps people didn't have, a maturity level that perhaps other people don't have, 
and a way of looking at the world, which perhaps other people don't have. But again, it's not their fault. So part of the responsibility lies with us. A larger responsibility, I think, falls with the community that we um, become a part of. Paul, incidentally, will be conducting a, a session this afternoon, Understanding Loss and the Journey Through Grie uh, Grief. It'll be upstairs in room 403, I think, at 2.30 this afternoon. And Brian said earlier in this week, he said, make sure you tell the audience that any of us on the panel who will be around during the day would be very open for you to come up and have a one-on-one -on -one with them if you wanted to uh, have them uh, extend on their remarks here on the panel this morning. We're going to take some questions, a few questions from the audience before we uh, go off into the breakaway groups. But uh, Paul just touched on it. I'd like to ask Brian and, and Dan mentioned it earlier uh, and Michelle did too, touched on it. Uh, of It's a quid pro quo situation, really. I mean, we're talking about what universities have to do uh, to become conscious of uh, this new group of veterans who are coming on campus because of the Yellow Ribbon Program. But they, obviously, just witnessing them, seeing them, listening to them this morning, bring enormous strengths uh, to a university. I've watched it here on our uh, campus at George Washington University as role models uh, ambitious students, so many focused. Uh, what are some of the positive things, Brian, you say because of your experience you, you have given George Washington University? Oh, I wouldn't know if it's all to GW, but I, I think it's important to emphasize how much the, how much positive aspects and strengths that the students bring to the classroom and to the community. And I, I think that we as a community, particularly the veterans community, tend to harp on the negative aspect of being veterans. And I mean, if, even if you just look down, we have a lot on you know, wounded warrior transition and traumatic, traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress. And that is fortunately still a minority in the veteran population. And I had the privilege of working essentially with Dr. Berger from the Vietnam Parents of America. And we talk a lot about how we have to advocate for those who won't speak out for themselves. But that doesn't mean that all the vets are broken. Right? So I had the privilege of addressing the freshman class on 9-11, and I said, just because you've seen us like that doesn't mean that we're not approachable, doesn't mean that we're broken or we don't want to be you know, your fraternity brother or your roommate or your colleague or your chemi chemistry partner. I mean, we are, we are very strong, and I think that there is a two-way street that the vets have to adapt themselves to the long legacy of higher education, which we're not inclined to try and change. But on the flip side, that academics have the opportunity now to adapt the way they teach and they handle a population of students to be more customer service focused. And I, I use the example for post-traumatic stress that if, say, you're taking a class on World War II and you want to illustrate D-Day, and obviously one of the most important dates in our history, and well, one of the best representations of that is the opening scenes of Saving Private Ryan, and I'm not here to you know, take away from the cinematic expertise that that is. Do you ask if that's uncomfortable for anyone? Do we? You know, is that something that I want to see again on a, you know, a Thursday afternoon after my lunch? Maybe not. But do we consider that? Do you ask if there are veterans in your classrooms? Can you legally ask if there are veterans in your classrooms? Is that a violation of privacy? I mean, these are issues that our community has to tackle. What do you do if you, I say yes? Do you call on me every time you teach a class about Iraq? It happens taking a class on the geography of the Middle East. Well, let me tell you, it comes up. Do I want to be picked out? Do I want to be singled out? Maybe, maybe not. I would say yes, but they can't make me shut up. So you have to enable people to be individuals and not to just label vets as vets. Because, or, I mean, look at our panel. Look how diverse this community is. Um, one of the opening remarks of Secretary Duckworth when she received her awards was to have the veterans stand, and then we sat down, and then she asked the Vietnam veterans to stand. And she said, thank you for how much that generation has done for our generation of vets, silently and relatively without thanks, that how much they have paved the way or have had the way paved behind them in advocating for us. And one of our strongest sponsors now are Vietnam veterans who are going out of their way to say, this will not happen again. And we have a responsibility to carry on that tradition as they go into their well-deserved retirement, that we now must take that on and help <laughs> this, Tom, <laughs> uh, that we have to make sure that no vet is left behind regardless of generation. And I think we're done. 
emphasize well-deserved. Yeah, well-deserved. Go on. <laughs> we're just going to take a moment. If there were one or two questions you might have that you'd like to pose now, or maybe you'll find answers to those questions as we move through the day with any of the breakout groups. Yes, ma'am. They do. Uh, well, and it's actually, they, the short answer is yes. Okay, just put it that way. Yes, they do. And, and we've actually had students use it. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I think Dan could probably talk about that too, but I, I, there is a certain a certain amount of situational awareness. I got home in May and I was in class in August. I mean, that you can't turn that off. Um, yeah. And also, that's one of the things Brian was saying is is very much an individual thing. As you mentioned, you know, the infantry guy who's out on patrol 18 hours a day uh, for 15 months in Iraq is going to have a different experience than uh, that army person who's sitting on a fob, do, uh, sitting at a desk working you know eight-hour shifts and. Because there is that extreme, I think the individual approach is very important. But, and you're going to have even, even that aspect. I mean, car backfires, book falls off the desk. I've hit the ground. I mean, it, does that make me weak? No, I think it just makes me a little more sensitive. I mean, I try to avoid potholes in the road. That makes me a good <laughs> driver, right? So I, I think that there is that understanding. But you're right, sir, that, that the sensitivity to the fact that that exists. And then how does the community respect or disrespect that. And one of the things I said to the freshmen was, you have the opportunity to have an open mind this year, because next year you will have formed your impressions of a community. So do you say, you were in Iraq, so you kill people? Or do you say, so you were in Iraq? Well, that's interesting. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. But though, I mean, that kind of acceptance, so yeah, I have post-traumatic stress and a traumatic brain injury. Tell me I'm a weak person. You know, I mean, that kind of impression has to be broken. And it's only going to be broken in communities like this where we can actually have a functioning and intelligent dialogue about it instead of going off the pundits. So no. I agree, sir. We'll take one more question. Yes, sir, over here. Um, it's definitely a unique situation. I was a minority at the academy. Um, I think we had less than 30% start and our percentages dropped. We only graduated about 50% of our starting class. So it was very unique there. And I think I have a tendency to like the veteran guys more as my friends because I'm not used to being around competitive females. And that was a hard thing for me to accept in a program of 72 people. I think there's seven guys in it. So it's a hard thing to accept that, you know, females are very catty, especially at a younger age, I think. Um, and so it, it has, it's been a big adjustment of, it's just hard to fit into that because I don't buy into it. And I never did, and that was part of the reason I went in the military, because it was more if they respected you for doing your job and doing your job well, and it didn't matter if you were a male or a female. And I feel like in that class, I'm looked at as a threat sometimes. Um, because I have had different experiences, so it's been a hard adjustment. She is. <laughs> well, we want to thank all of our panelists. So thank you very much, Dan, Michelle, Paul, and Brian. <laughs> and your attention and questions reveal what a wonderful audience you are, and we're going to get off into our breakaway sessions now. And thank you all for being here today, and welcome to the George Washington University.